soon, I'm going to read the story of Ruby Bridges by Robert Coles, illustrated by George Ford. Our Ruby taught us a lot. She became someone who helped change our country. She was part of history, just like generals and presidents are part of history. They're leaders and so was Ruby. She led us away from hate and she led us nearer to knowing each other, the white folks and the black folks. This is from Ruby's mother. Ruby Bridges was born in a small cabin near Tylertown, Mississippi. We were very, very poor, Ruby said. My daddy worked picking crops. We just barely got by. There were times when we didn't have much to eat. The people who owned the land were bringing in machines to pick the crops. So my daddy lost his job and that's when we had to move. I remember us leaving. I was four, I think. This sort of sounds like COVID-19 where many of our parents have lost their jobs and they're having to do different things in order to bring food to the table. In 1957, the family moved to New Orleans. Ruby's father became a janitor. Her mother took care of the children during the day. After they were tucked in bed, Ruby's mother went to work scrubbing floors in a bank. Every Sunday, the family went to church. We wanted our children to be near God's spirit, Ruby's mother said. We wanted them to start feeling close to him from the very start. And that's where we all should try to be from the very start to put God in our program. At that time, black children and white children went to separate schools in New Orleans. The black children were not able to receive the same education as the white children. It wasn't fair and it was against the nation's law. In 1960, a judge ordered four black girls to go to two white elementary schools. Three of the girls were sent to McDonough 19. 16 year old Ruby Bridges was sent to first grade in the William France Elementary School. I wonder why they chose four black girls instead of mixing it up with girls and boys. You think girls are calmer, braver? Maybe not but four were chosen and Ruby was one of the four. Ruby's parents were proud that their daughter had been chosen to take part in an important event in American history. They went to church. We sat there and prayed to God, Ruby's mother said, that we'd all be strong and we'd have courage and we'd get through any trouble and Ruby would be a good girl and she'd hold her head up high and be a credit to her own people and a credit to all the American people. We prayed long and we prayed hard. Can you see it? Okay. On Ruby's first day, a large crowd of angry white people gathered outside the France Elementary School. The people carried signs that said they didn't want black children in a white school. People called Ruby names. Some wanted to hurt her. The city and state police did not help Ruby. The president of the United States ordered federal marshals to walk with Ruby into the school building. The marshals carried guns. Every day, for weeks that turned into months, Ruby experienced that kind of school day. She walked to the France school surrounded by marshals, wearing a clean dress and a bow in her hair and carrying her lunch pail. Ruby walked slowly for the first few blocks. As Ruby approached the school, 
she saw a crowd of people marching up and down the street. Men and women and children shouted at her. They pushed towards her. The marshals kept them from Ruby by threatening to arrest them. Ruby would hurry through the crowd and not say a word. Can you imagine a six-year-old going through a crowd of grown-ups who are threatening violence? Do you think you could do that? It's kind of hard. The white people in the neighborhood would not send their children to school. When Ruby got inside the building, she was all alone except for her teacher, Mrs. Henry. There were no other children to keep Ruby company to play with and learn with, to eat lunch with. Can you see Ruby? She has the entire classroom by herself. The teacher to herself, so she did a lot of good learning one-on-one -on -one, while the rest of the children were staying home. But every day, Ruby went into the classroom with a big smile on her face, ready to get down to the business of learning. She was polite and she worked well at her desk. Mrs. Henry said she enjoyed her time there. She didn't seem nervous or anxious or irritable or scared. She seemed as normal and relaxed as any child I've ever taught. So Ruby began learning how to read and write in an empty classroom, an empty building. Sometimes I'd look at her and wonder how she did it, said Mrs. Henry. How she went by those mobs and sat here all by herself and yet seemed so relaxed and comfortable. Can you see Ruby? Okay. Mrs. Henry would question Ruby in order to find out if the girl was really nervous and afraid, even though she seemed so calm and confident. But Ruby kept saying she was doing fine. The teacher decided to wait and see if Ruby would keep on being so relaxed and hopeful, or if she gradually began to wear down, or even decide that she no longer wanted to go to school. Then one morning, something happened. Mrs. Henry stood by a window in her classroom as she usually did, watching Ruby walk towards the school. Suddenly, Ruby stopped, right in front of the mob of howling and screaming people. She stood there facing all those men and women. She seemed to be talking to them. Mrs. Henry saw Ruby's lips moving and wondered what Ruby could be saying. The crowd seemed ready to kill her. The marshals were frightened. They tried to persuade Ruby to move along. They tried to hurry her into the school, but Ruby wouldn't budge. Then Ruby stopped talking and waded into the school. And walked into the school. What do you think Ruby was saying? you have stopped in front of that crowd and started talking? Let's see what had happened that caused Ruby to stop at that particular spot. When she went into the classroom, Mrs. Henry asked her what happened. Mrs. Henry told Ruby that she'd been watching and that she was surprised when Ruby stopped and talked with the people in the mob. Ruby became irritated. I wonder why she became irritated. All this time she had been calm, confident, even though she had to go through those 
people every morning. And now as she sat listening to her teacher, she's irritated. Doesn't make sense, does it? I didn't stop and talk with them, she said. Ruby, I saw you talking, Mrs. Henry said. I saw your lips moving. I wasn't talking, said Ruby. I was praying. I was praying for them to speak. Every morning, Ruby had stopped a few blocks away from school to say a prayer for the people who hated her. This morning, she forgot until she was already in the middle of her angry mom. Do you think you would be able to pray for people who are intent on hurting you? kind of hard, but Ruby had prayed, her family had prayed, so she was confident, I can do this. When school was over for the day, Ruby hurried through the mob as usual. After she walked a few blocks and the crowd was behind her, Ruby said the prayer she repeated twice a day, before and after school. Please, God, try to forgive those people. Because even if they say those bad things, they don't know what they're doing. So you can forgive them, just like you did those folks a long, long time ago when they said terrible things about you. Can you see Ruby praying? Twice a day, praying for those who did not care for her. Later that year, two white boys joined Ruby at the French Elementary School. Their parents were tired of seeing the boys get into mischief around the house when they could have been in school and learning. The mob became very angry when the first white students went back to school. But those boys were soon joined by others. We've been sitting back and letting our children get cheated out of an education because some people have tried to take the law into their own hands. It's time for us to fight for the side of the law and for our children's right to go to school and get their education. This is what one of the white parents said. They all did get their education. Ruby and a growing number of boys and girls went to school with her. By the time Ruby was in the second grade, the mob had given up their struggle to scare Ruby and defeat the federal judges who ordered that New Orleans schools be segregated so that children of all races might be in the same classroom. Year after year, Ruby went to the French school. She graduated from it and went on to graduate from high school. Ruby Bridges is married to a building contractor and has four sons. Now a successful businesswoman, she has created the Ruby Bridges Educational Foundation. With this focus on education, community, and the future of our nation's children, the foundation is especially dedicated to revitalizing the William Fred School, which is located in the heart of the Ninth Ward in Orleans. Ruby is once again stepping to the forefront and embracing an opportunity to make history by contributing to the challenge that our nation is facing in the recovery efforts following Hurricane Katrina. There's also a special exhibit featuring Ruby's story at the Children's Museum of Indianapolis in Indianapolis, Indiana called The Power of Children Making a Difference. So children, don't ever think that you're so small that you can't make a difference. Remember Ruby Bridges, six years old, being forced her to go to a school where she wasn't wanted, but she went and she succeeded. You can do it too.
Good evening, boys and girls. My name is Arnold Adams, and I will be reading Hope for Hades by Jesse Joshua Watson. Hope for Hades. When the earth shook and took away my neighborhood, I thought I would never be happy again. Welling fear filled my ears, dust filled my nose, and tears filled my eyes. I helped my mother build a new home in the soccer stadium one piece of tin, six posts, and three sheets. Many people have come here to help make shelter. Some kids wandered around lost or wait in line for water. I am too small to compete for food that the blue hats are passing out. So I sat and watched strangers speaking different languages quickly pass boxes towards the front of the line. You see the blue hats? The blue hats are from the United Nations. In my neighborhood, People lie in the shade of tarps. Many of them were injured. When I see a girl kicking a ball made of rags, I remember how to use, I remember how we used to be happy playing before the quake. Can I play, I ask? Sure, she says. We're juggling the ball, trying to keep it off the ground. Other kids come running to join us. Now we have a game. I forget about my hunger as I dribble the ball through two defenders and pass it to a teammate. We keep the ball moving quickly between us like a dance. I shoot the ball between two piles of sandals and jump into the arms of my teammates like I've seen them do on TV. Both teams burst into laughter until an old woman shisses us as she passes. This is no time to laugh, she scolds. There is too much sadness here. As she walks away, a man nearby says, Don't worry, children. It's not your fault. She has much to mourn. And she does not understand the power of this game. The man grins and starts dribbling our ball. So, so, any of you been to a game in the stadium? Several of the children nod. I smile and I say, my father took me to a match here. We had a picnic with green papaya salad and he bar bought me a soda. Seeing those players made me want to be a soccer star when I grow up. I remember watching Mano Sanon, Haiti's most famous soccer player, score goals on this field. The man says he was just he was just a city kid like you. No difference.
well, maybe Haiti used to be good, but Brazil is the best team in the world now, declares a boy. We can't win anymore. Just look at our stadium. The man picks up a ball of rags and tries juggling it on his knees. The rags are soaked with mud to keep slipping from the rubber bands that holds them together. Wow, that's incredible. Listen, I must get back to help the others, he says. But before I go, I would like to give you kids something. He ducks into his shelter. When he comes back out, he is carrying a ball, a real soccer ball. Check this out. Wow, incredible. He hands it to me and turns to go. It's an old ball, but in perfect condition. There is a signature written on the ball, but I can't read it. A boy looks closely. It says, Mano Santa. Wow, look at that. All of the kids gather close to see. Wait, I call. You can't give us this ball away. It's signed by Mano. We can't let go of the past, the man tells us. He says again, we can let go of the past, the man tells us. Right now, we need to think about your future. And the future is you. I put my arms around the man and the other kids all swarm him with hugs. Thank you, mister, we all say. Don't thank me, children, he says. Thank you. Thank you for reminding me why there is hope for Haiti. We return to our game playing better than ever. I pass the ball to my teammates who traps it on his chest, then flicks it over the head of a defender. Can any of you boys and girls do this? I run for the ball. I'm no longer barefoot and I wear or wearing torn shorts. I am wearing the Haitian uniform and the stadium is packed with fans screaming out my name. I beat the defender to the ball, spin around and glance at the net. With the Brazilian team racing towards me, I take one more step. Shoot in. Go. He scores. What a wonderful story and a magical ending. Maybe one day you could be a superstar on the soccer field and in life. Thank you for giving me an opportunity to read this story to you. May you take this book, be motivated, and have a restful sleep. Good night. Good night. Thank you.